household could be paying £6,000 a year come April. But what's being done? Not a single move has been made to drill for North Sea gas or cap its prices to not be dragged into the same astronomical increases across the globe. Nobody seems to have gone cap in hands to Oslo, where we buy most of our energy to negotiate a better deal. The Geological Survey, commissioned on fracking back in April, hasn't translated into action. And scoff as we may, it's the EU's reliance on Russian gas. At least they have a plan to allow governments to step in to help deal with severe shortages and spiralling prices. But it seems we're being run by a zombie government. Meanwhile, the ongoing political turmoil is straining confidence in our currency, seeing our petrol prices stay sky high. Don't let them tell you it's all Putin's fault. There's a lot more governments could and should do. And with the latest decision on the price cap due by the end of this week, we need leadership now. So as Boris bronzes his moobs and Truss and Sunak play school debating society, for businesses and households up and down the country, every second wasted is one step closer to a crisis, the likes of which this country hasn't seen in decades. Well, let's first speak with Arjan Gavecki, who's the director of the Energy Intensive Users Group, an organisation which represents the interests of energy intensive industrial consumers. Arjan, I mean, the, the amount that energy is costing now and that it's going to go up to, are you expecting mass closures in your sector and among the people that you represent? Not quite. It's probably a bit too, of, uh, too, diff too early to tell that at the moment. But energy prices have certainly increased fivefold in case of gas and uh, similar to electricity. But up to a point, energy, certain energy time industries have been able to hatch themselves if they had struck energy contract last year, for example. And on the other hand, uh, some energy, but some energy time industries, but no mean all, um, all have been able to pass on the energy cost increases into their final product prices. So it's not as bad as yet for domestics, but uh, pressure is certainly increasing. I mean, what sort of things are people saying when they're coming to you? Do, is there a lot of complaints that there's been government inactivity? That The whole conversation is about growth, growth, growth. But surely when people can't afford to buy stuff and power, you know, places that use huge amounts of power can't afford to just have energy running full time at the same levels as, say, a year ago, that not many people are in the mood for investing right now. That's partly correct, yeah. So uh, there's a long-standing uh, issue on industrial electricity prices in particular, where there is a differential between the UK industrial electricity prices and European industrial electricity prices. And that's certainly deterring investments in the UK. Uh, that has now been submuted due to the increase in the wholesale electricity price. Um, on the other hand, uh, what's causing is adding to the uncertainty as well is the security of energy supply situation in the UK, uh, which is uh, the risks certainly on that side have increased uh, compared to previous years. You know, I mean, first of all, why is it? You just said that our uh, energy prices, industrial energy prices, electric prices, are much higher than in Europe. Why is that? Four reasons for that. First, it's the electricity mix in the UK. So that's been the term set more or less by gas. Uh, and in France, for example, it's more set by nuclear. Scandinavia set by hydro. And in Germany, set by more by coal. Uh, the second thing is the carbon price support mechanism, which is a carbon tax that drives up the wholesale price further in the UK relative to other countries. Um, in the UK, thirdly, we have a specific network charging arrangement that is different than in the rest of Europe. And fourthly, we have more uh, policy cost on ele industrial electricity prices, and that's higher relative to the rest of in Europe as well. I mean, are these things that the government could quickly act on, or is it a far more complex system? The electricity mix itself is a far more complex system. You can't simply uh, build a host of nuclear, new nuclear power stations. Uh, that will take time. On the other hand, uh, policy cost on directly on the control of government so they can do something about it which they have 
done their proposed uh, to increase a so-called reduction in indirect cost due to the renewable financing mechanisms, uh, but that's just one element of the cumulative impact. Would you be expecting anything approaching the sort of three-day week that we saw in the 70s, the last time the UK faced an energy crisis, arguably, of this proportion? Uh, no, I think the UK's energy mix is much more diversified than um, in, the, in the 1970s, and there are far more robust mechanisms placed to prevent that from happening. However... Uh, the risk of uh, electricity, energy price by gas as well as electricity over the winter is definitely increasing and that will have an impact on production. Would it not be an option potentially for the government to do something like decoupling electricity from carbon pricing? Or at this stage, could that not be on the table? Uh, potentially, one hand, you have the carbon price support mechanism, which is an additional to the emission trading system in the UK. So that's one option that they can take. Um, I'm not quite sure that they will um, do anything about the price differential between carbon in the UK, carbon price in the UK, and the carbon price in Europe. Um, but those are relatively, not, not minor, but not as big as some of the other uh, policy costs on industrial energy prices. I mean, is there a sort of uh, sense that everything's in limbo right now while we're waiting for the new look government to take shape and perhaps some of these ideas and policies being put on the table? A little bit. I do have to get that impression. Although, to be fair to government, they have taken some measures to keep uh, coal-fired power stations on standby over the winter, uh, as well as uh, putting... Uh, allowing ROF to put back uh, in operation. That's the gas storage facility off the coast of England. All, on the other hand, if you see the analysis and what's happening in Europe, you expect government to be more proactive uh, to prevent any security of emergency. Ajahn, thank you so much for coming on and uh, talking about this. It's uh, something that's not really being talked about a lot. A lot of conversations about how much households are going to pay. But, yeah, I mean, for organisations such as yours, Energy Intensive Users Group, uh, energy is the, 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 the big topic, isn't it? So, Ajahn, thanks so much for coming and shining a light, so to speak, on this matter. Well, joining me now is Catherine Porter, who's an energy consultant for What Logic, an independent organisation. Uh, Catherine... I was just discussing with Arjan whether more could be done by the government. Um, electric prices for manufacturing, industrial electric prices in the UK, far higher than those on the continent. I mean, is there this process of sitting on our hands while we wait for a new leader? Is there more that could be done? Um, well, I think we are sitting on our hands at the moment. I don't think there's going to be any meaningful announcements before a new prime minister is in place, which is unfortunate. Um, but there are various actions that the government can take. Uh, primarily, it's going to be through direct subsidies, both to industry and to households. The next lifting of the energy price cap is expected to be announced by the end of this week. What are you expecting there? Well, I think it'll be in line with what people have been suggesting, so something around £3,500 for the next three months. And uh, in terms of you're an energy consultant, what sort of things are you advising both businesses and households right now in the light of that energy price cap being lifted and further, further lifts to come in the future with the price going up and up possibly to around £6,000 a year come April for the average household? So I don't really work with households. Um, I think the main advice for households really is that there's not a huge amount of point in switching. There aren't really better deals out there than the default tariff. Um, and that the focus is really on whether you can reduce your energy usage, which is difficult anyway with um, standing charges being high. For businesses, one of the things that I've been recommending is that they look at getting backup generation. There's a real danger this winter that businesses will see their electricity and gas usage being curtailed by National Grid. Um, and so if they have backup generation, that will allow them to continue their operations regardless. So if businesses don't necessarily have backup generation, could they essentially be facing blackouts, so to speak? Well, I think 
price, industrial electric price is higher than Europe. That's been the case actually for quite a long time now. Um, this strategy for pushing for growth seems very misplaced because who on earth is going to want to come and invest in creating yeah. a big manufacturing plant in the UK when energy costs are soaring? You might hope that longer term then the cutting corporation tax might work than the NICS national insurance increase cut. This is all if Liz Trust wins. But what more should, will she do? We don't know what she'll do to help families yet. We're waiting to hear more. We know what Richard Sunak might, might try and do. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, is that enough to get more investment in? It's so uncertain at the moment. And these forecasts, you say on today, Telegraph, 19, 20% inflation, a big concern. It is forecast to fall sharply too, by the way. That's the way up, but the way down could be a swift. It could be in two or three years' time, we're back down to where we were just two years ago. So it might be a, a blip. We're watching Ukraine, that's uncertain, um, and other issues too. So I think it's not clear. Oh, Chris, thank you so much Sorry for that. Let's so hope gloomy, what Alex. does come down <laughs> indeed. It's going to be a tough winter for everyone. Chris giving us some hope there. <laughs> See what I did? It's my job. It is indeed. A lot of warmth, a lot of humidity and uh, quite a lot of cloud. Having said that, we started the day with a fair bit of sunshine over the east. Uh, many eastern parts of England will stay generally dry and bright, it's just the cloud increasing. Further west, we've got some heavier rain through Wales and we could see some heavy showers developing over the Midlands, parts of northwest England through the afternoon. Not a great deal of rain across the southeast. Some patchy rain getting into southern Scotland, much of northern Scotland staying dry. It is quite warm. Temperature in the teens across northern Scotland, but elsewhere getting into the low to mid 20s. We'll see a bit more of that showery rain working across into northeast England, Lincolnshire, and eastern parts of Scotland through the evening. For the west, it does become a little bit drier with clearer spells, uh, but it will still be quite a warm night. It's only a warmer night than last night across much of Scotland, with temperatures holding up in towns and cities in the mid teens. So, again, that warm, that humid feel as we head into tomorrow. Again, a bit of a messy picture with a fair bit of cloud around, but some sunny spells over the Midlands, eastern England, northeast Scotland, but quite a bit more cloud further west. Northern Ireland may brighten up at times, but Wales and southwest England looking likely to see some further heavy showers developing by the afternoon. They'll be hit and miss, however, and in the brighter spells, again, feeling quite warm temperatures in the southeast with a bit of sunshine, could get into the high 20s for a time. The likelihood of a few more of those heavy showers across parts of the Midlands, South Wales, spreading into northern England during Tuesday evening and further wet weather could come into the southwest as we head into Wednesday. It is all very messy through the rest of this week with some showers around, but still some warm sunshine across the southeast, looking a little drier as we head towards the weekend. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
Welcome back. You're with Alex Phillips on GB News. Well, it's time to talk some proverbial excrement. <laughs> or more to the point, the amount of human effluence in our rivers and seas, because as water companies prove they weren't drought-proof and able to provide us with the water we need, they're also proving they can't safely get rid of the wastewater we don't. Pumping gallons of sewage into our seas and rivers on a daily basis, making our waterways some of the most toxic and filthy in Europe. Well, it's a topic both the Lib Dems and Labour are shouting about, with the Libs accusing the big water companies of failing to monitor the amount of sewage pumped into our seas, and Labour saying it amounts to over 9 million hours worth of waste over the past five years alone, an increase of over 2,000 500%. Well, now more than 50 beaches are off limits due to horrific waste pollution. Our southwest of England reporter Jeff Moody is in Swanage on the Dorset coast and has been looking at the state of the beaches there. Well, the discharge here in Swanage happened last Wednesday. Uh, but to be honest with you, I could have picked anywhere on the coast from Hastings all the way to Land's End and up the coast too, as far as Cumbria. The problem really has been everywhere over the south coast. Well, uh, south, uh, the water companies are saying, uh, well, they're keen to point out that 95% is just rainwater, but it's the other 5% that we're more concerned about. That's where the salmonella, the E. coli, and the hepatitis B comes into force if you come into contact with that raw sewage. Why is this happening? Well, it's happened very simply because of the weather. We had very, very dry, hot weather, as we know. The ground became very baked, not as porous as it usually is. And so when the rains came, the Victorian sewage system that we have, mainly in this country, just couldn't cope. So the choice is you either discharge to the sea, which, by the way, is perfectly legal if need be, or you end up with raw sewage all over the street. So that's why putting it into the sea is the better of two evils. Well, the water companies are saying, look, use your own initiative as to whether you want to swim in the sea. But how can you tell? There's no way of telling. The water in this country by the sea always looks this colour. So there's no real way of telling whether it's uh, infected with sewage or not. And that is the problem. Mm, pretty grim. Well, Josh Bab Babarindi is a Lib Dem councillor at <coughs> Eastbourne Borough Council and joins us now. Josh, I mean, the Lib Dems today saying that way too much uh, sewage waste is being poured into the seas because the water companies are frankly not even monitoring it. You are a councillor in Eastbourne, famed, of course, as a, a, a wonderful coastal resort. Uh, what's the situation like where you are? That's right. Eastbourne is the sunniest town in the UK. People flock to our town year after year to enjoy our wonderful beaches. But what we're seeing from the likes of Southern Water uh, is environmental vandalism um, and economic destruction as a result. Um, just look at the you know photos that you've got up there. Uh, look at the videos in places like Seaford um, of sewage being pumped uh, into our precious waters. Last week in Eastbourne, we had the world's largest free seafront air show, Airborne. Um, every year, the sea is full of people enjoying themselves and swimming. This year, hardly anyone in there. And these water companies, um, they don't even know um, how much precisely they're pumping uh, into our waters, uh, because 14%, for example, of Southern Waters sewage monitors are faulty, um, or they're not existent at all. Um, at the same time, these companies are making huge profits. Southern Water made over £100 million profit uh, last year. Um, their execs are getting huge bonuses, an average of £100,000 um, a year, according to uh, some research that the Liberal Democrats have completed. Um, and what we're calling for is these bonuses uh, to be banned uh, until they can get a grip uh, of this. We're calling uh, for these companies to get serious um, about their monitoring. And we're calling for a sewage tax um, on these companies' profits so that we can show them who's boss and ensure that our sewage system is invested in. I mean, these companies would say, actually, that they are monitored by Ofwat and do face some pretty hefty fines. And legally, they are actually allowed to pump sewage into the seas. I mean, but this has been going on unchecked 
for the past five years. It's taken until now, really, for this to come to light and Labour and Lib Dem uh, perhaps opportunising a little bit and suddenly coming up with solutions that they weren't talking about over the past five years. Um, but, I mean, other than, you know, making quite simple statements like, well, we should take it off the uh, bonuses of the big bosses, of course, that's going to go down well with a lot of members of the public. It's not going to solve the problem, is it? Well, what will fundamentally solve the problem is if this government gets serious about regulating these companies. Last autumn, the government had the opportunity to do so. There were some really serious options on the table to get to grips with this. Yet Conservative MPs all across the country, including uh, in my patch uh, in Eastbourne, uh, decided to vote for the current system that we have, the system that has enabled all of these discharges, the system that is polluting my beaches uh, in Eastbourne. Uh, the government must take this seriously. And also local government uh, must take this seriously as well. That's why in Eastbourne, back in February, you know, months ago, um, we called on Southern Water through um, a uh, official uh, motion that I propose at, at the council to get to grips with this. And do you know what happened? Conservative councillors voted it down. They voted down the opportunity to hold these companies to account. They voted down uh, the opportunity um, to tax uh, these companies, to call on the government uh, to implement a sewage tax. Fortunately, we run the council uh, as Liberal Democrats uh, in Eastbourne. Uh, and so we're still able to speak uh, with that loud voice. Uh, but we need the Conservatives to get serious about this because until then, or until we have an election, that is not going to change. Josh, thanks so much for coming on the programme today. That's Josh Babarindi, who's a Lib Dem councillor in Eastbourne. Let's go back to Chris Hope. Um, I mean, yet another crisis. The government are saying they're talking to the energy companies right now to try and stop this discharge from storm overflows. But it just seems that, you know, these things are mounting up, mounting yeah. up, mounting up, and no one seems to be in charge of it. What's, what is going on? What's, what's the root of all these problems? Well, there's, there's a power vacuum at the top of government. We've got Boris Johnson in checkers, or wherever he might be, not really engaging with the current political agenda. He did some calls over the weekend on uh, to, the, to the US president, I think, and some... some no, on national security measures, but on the, there was a feeling of drift at the government, and the Lib Dems there, Josh there from Eastbourne, is clearly making this making this work as a political attack. This work the Lib Dems have done about showing how little monitoring is done of, of sewage, in fact, it's, it means it's been much worse than we know about at the moment, shows how I think it's, it cuts through, I think. It's not really a... It cuts through and, and shows a lack of care for the environment. I mean, Margaret Thatcher back in 89 gave, gave, a, gave a huge speech about the environment. Being kind to the environment used to be a big, used to be a big issue for the Tories. And I think they're completely behind the, 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 the uh, debate on this one. Yeah, I do sense that maybe the regulators aren't really up to much either. I mean, off jam, no. off what the lot of them... Well, the feeling they often they, they're more like spokesmen for, a, for a, uh, uh, an industry, not, not one that's meant to be policing it and getting best value and cleaning it up for the rest of us. I think there's a problem here, I think, and the, and the Tories are risking something in the West Country, South West. That's where the Lib Dems are strong going to the next election cycle. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Well, let me know what you think. GBviews at gbnews.uk. A fears of sewage making you think twice about taking a dip in the sea. You know, during uh, a couple of years ago, during one of the lockdowns, I lived in my brother's <laughs> garden shed in Eastbourne. True story. And I used to swim in that sea every day. It makes me kind of want to hurl now. <laughs> Email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Now, coming up on We Need to Talk About, after criminal barristers vote to go on indefinite strike in September. I'm asking, what will that mean for the wheels of justice? Now, it's time for a check on the news headlines. Good afternoon, it's 33 minutes past two. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. Criminal barristers in England and Wales will stage an indefinite and uninterrupted strike next month. Members of the Criminal Bar Association have already been walking out in alternate weeks in a dispute with the government over jobs, pay and legal aid funding. The new and all-out industrial action will start on the 5th of September. 
The Labour leader is calling on the next Prime Minister to make insulating homes a national mission amid soaring energy bills. Sir Keir Starmer has set out plans to upgrade 19 million homes over the next decade. Meanwhile, Rishi Sunak has criticised Liz Truss, claiming her plans to tackle the cost of living crisis could plunge the economy into an inflation spiral. Ms Truss argues her plans will help the UK economy. Ex-Formula One boss Bernie Eccleston has pleaded not guilty to a charge of fraud. He's accused of allegedly failing to declare £400 million of overseas assets to the government between 2013 and 2016. The 91-year-old made his first appearance at Westminster Magistrates Court after being charged last month. Russia is accusing Ukraine of assassinating the daughter of one of President Vladimir Putin's top supporters. The Kremlin's internal security service, the FSB, claims a Ukrainian citizen was behind the attack. Daria Dugina was killed by a suspected car bomb on a road outside Moscow on Saturday night. Ukraine has denied involvement and the allegations have not yet been independently verified. And the Scottish Government is being urged to intervene and prevent international embarrassment for Edinburgh as a strike by council staff has left bins overflowing. The Conservatives and the Liber Liberal Democrats are both demanding action, although First Minister Nicola Sturgeon says she hopes the improved pay offer will be sufficient to end the disruption. Disruption. The walkout is the first in a series of protests planned by trade unions over pay. It will continue until the 30th of August. You're watching GB News on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. We'll get back to Alex in just a moment. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to We Need to Talk About. This is GB News and I'm Alex Phillips. And so, the latest strikes to strangle backlog Britain is barristers in England and Wales who will walk out of courts indefinitely next month in a dispute over pay. Members of the Criminal Bar Association have been walking out in alternate weeks, but they've now voted in favour of an indefinite and uninterrupted strike from the 5th of September unless they get a 25% pay rise. The Ministry of Justice says more than 6,000 court hearings have been disrupted so far as a result of the dispute over conditions and government set fees for legal aid advocacy work. And that's at a time when there are already 66,000 cases waiting to be heard, with the waiting time for a day in court often reaching 
years. Well, joining me now is Grace Gwynn, one of the UK's youngest barristers. She's currently practising family law, but has worked in criminal law. Grace, I mean, most people have a tendency to think, oh, well, you know, people in the legal profession, they're pays, paid loads. What do they want now with a pay rise of up to 25%? But actually, we're not talking about people earning big bucks, are we? We're talking about those who are still working on a taxpayer budget, basically, to try some of the most complex cases. Absolutely. And I think that stigma and that stereotype is far from accurate. And actually, the, the members of the junior criminal bar are really struggling. And when you take into account the hours it takes to prepare a case, plus the travelling and the time spent in court, sometimes they're making less than minimum wage. And so these strikes are a desperate cry to the government to hear the desperation from the criminal bar to say, give us the fair pay for the fair work that we're doing and help us because we love this job but we cannot financially survive on the pennies that we're getting paid for it. And there'll be people out there going, oh, well, you know, I wish I had the salary of uh, a lawyer. So what sort of, what is the salary of uh, the average um, barrister in criminal law? Well, it completely depends on their level of seniority and how long they've been doing the job. So the ones at the top of the game, yes, they are getting paid a pretty penny. But we're dealing with those at the junior end of the scale. And like I said, when you work out the hours that they have to put into this job, because ultimately they've got clients potentially facing custody, they want to do right by their client. So when you work out their hourly wage, it's less than minimum wage for some cases. And that's appalling when you look at the stresses that come with that job and the immense pressure that comes with it. And that's why these strikes are so important because they need the government to stand up and listen to what they're saying. This isn't about greed. The criminal bar is crumbling. I mean, we know that there is a huge backlog when it comes to uh, cases being heard in court. You know, people who face rape trials, for instance, waiting years, at which time it's even more difficult to give evidence. We, we really are in a, a mess of backlogs in the criminal justice system. So why strike now? Everyone's facing a cost of living crisis. But this, this story has been pre the cost of living crisis. This has been since the cuts to legal aid. And so the criminal bar has persevered and tried to work through those cuts. But it's got to the point where enough is enough. And whilst it is unfortunate for the delay for, for victims of crime, and it cannot be undeniable that that is the case, but ultimately we are losing good quality barristers because they are leaving the profession because they cannot financially survive. And so this isn't just about those that find themselves in a police station with a lengthy background of criminal activity. This is about also the innocent people that are accused of crime. You know, you want to have a competent barrister representing you throughout your trial of which will be the most daunting period of your life. But at the moment, we are losing far too many criminal practitioners at the junior end because they cannot financially survive on the money that they're making. And that's the real crisis here. You're saying we're losing them. Where are they going? Are they going into far better paid work in, in the private sector? Exactly. And whilst they love this job, if they're not lucky enough to come from a wealthy background, they need to find other ways to supplement that income. And ultimately, when you join this profession, you come with it with a huge amount of debt in any event. And therefore, it's hard to then struggle to continue just to survive and pay your bills, rent, mortgage whilst also doing this incredibly important, stressful job. And so it's about retaining the good quality barristers in this profession. And so for the future, we can provide in this country excellent level of representation for those accused of committing crime. Grace, thank you so much for coming on and talking about this. Grace Gwynn there, who is herself a barrister. Do you know what, Chris? I actually find myself having more sympathy yeah. with them because they have definitely not had their wages put up for a long time. Yeah. They'll have all had to pay a humongous amount of yeah. money on um, tuition fees to get to where they're going. They're starting off in their career and their salaries are far lower than the national average. And a lot of people don't realise that. Lower than the hourly minimum wage, Grace was saying now. And I've, I've known barristers and they say it to me all the time, why is no one listening to us? Two and a half thousand criminal barristers 
embarrasses their voting to strike, but, but nine out of ten voting to strike. Um, they want a 25% increase in legal fees. The government's offering 15%. 20% could be, the, could be the, the place they end up landing on. But it does seem grossly unfair. And I think I saw, saw uh, I was able to talk to a, a judge uh, last week privately, not for any kind of court case, but just talking about this issue. And he was saying that what he's worried about is you will have fewer working class people coming in, those with heavy student debt will come in, and you'll start, you'll, you'll, you'll make it less democratic in terms of who can be barristers, more richer people, richer families who are less in touch. I think there's a big issue here in how we deliver our justice. I wonder whether this is the end, maybe, of the criminal bar as we know it, and whether we go towards a national prosecuting service and it becomes taken all in-house and they're paid more like civil servants and away from this idea of putting bills in for legal aid. I wonder whether this could be the straw <clears throat> that breaks the camel's back. Now, talking about civil servants, <clears throat> you sort of uh, suggested to me uh, when we weren't uh, live on air that things, when it comes to strike mm. action, could be getting a lot worse. I think we are heading towards maybe a general strike this winter. I think there are, there are, there's talk of a mass civil service strike being announced on the first Monday of the Labour Party conference, and then there'll be a series of strikes and other unions might join in on different days. I think this could be a real, a real winter of discontent, Mark II, going through uh, autumn and into winter and early next year over pay. And I think this is the beginning, this is the, the harbinger of what's coming forward. This um, barrister strike starts on the first day of the new Prime Minister taking over, the new Tory leader on the 5th of September. I think going forward it's going to be much much worse. I think all the chat now that we have about these ideas, these Tory governments, uh, uh, the, between Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, I think that will be for the that will be for the past because I think events are going to take over very very quickly and it could be terminal for this current government. Blimey! Wow, uh, harbinger of doom indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Now, world heavyweight <clears throat> boxing champion Tyson Fury has called on the government to bring in tougher sentencing to address knife crime after his <clears throat> cousin was stabbed to death over the weekend. In a social media post, he slammed idiots who carry knives in what he called a pandemic, adding, you don't know how bad it is until it's one of your own. Asked if Labour would support tougher sentencing for, for knife, knife crime, Sir Keir Starmer said, for us all to come together to make sure that we put our shoulder to the wheel on this. Well, joining me now is anti-knife crime campaigner Dr Mark Prince, whose son Kyan was stabbed to death when he was 15 years old. Mark, I understand you actually know Tyson Fury. Yeah, I'm not going to pretend that we have a close relationship but we we're both in the same field and uh, I've sent him messages of condolences um, because now somebody else uh, has joined the same group of people that are in pain and grief and it's the kind of pain and grief that never really goes away and you don't get over it. So I really do feel for, for Rico, uh, his family, rest in peace, uh, that, that individual, their, their family member. Um, yeah, and this is so sad, you know. I just find it draining for me um, to be going through this process 16 years later. You, you talk to everybody, you do interviews, you, you've been in front of the mayor, you, you know, you talk and talk and talk. Nothing's been done, so you work and work and work because you want to get to reach the young people yourself because you feel like, well, if, if, if I can do something, well, I'm going to get out there and do it and make changes. But then you realise it's such a huge issue and a, and a problem. It's multi-layered that um, it's, it's, it's going to take a lot more than, you know, just uh, some organisations here and there trying to help with the situation. It's going to take a, a national uh, model programme that needs to be spread out throughout boroughs so um, we can help the people that are, are disenfranchised and being affected um, to begin to change their mindset. I mean, Tyson Fury describes it as a pandemic. Certainly statistics back up the fact that knife crime is definitely on the rise. What is behind this and what needs to be done? I mean, what sort of action do you think needs to be taken immediately to try and get this scourge of knife crime off our streets? The action that needs to be taken is a collective. So where the children come from? They come from homes and parents. So parents have to ensure that they're doing 
all that they can do because respect starts in your home. Respect for authority, respect for teachers, behavior towards community members, valuing lives. This is starts at home. Um, the police have got a lot to do with it um, and, and how they police and how they develop relationships in their community uh, because community relationships are broken down and they're not very good. There's, there's loads of different issues here. There's issues with technology and how children have access. Guys are buying big, huge Rambo knives online. Why have they got access to these things? We, we've got um, problems with, with inflation and poverty and, and just the mindset of young people coming up, actually understanding the value of life because they've been hit with so much images of violence. It becomes, it becomes nothing. They become desensitized to it. You know, that's a part of entertainment for them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is horrific. Uh, Dr. Mark Prince, thank you so much for coming on the programme and talking about this topic. Chris, I mean, it's just, you know, if we were America, this yeah. would be guns, wouldn't it? At the yeah. end of the day, it's yeah. a similar problem. Young people carrying weapons and needlessly, needlessly murdering What's the answer? Them. Tyson Fury is talking about more sentences. The problem is the big backlog of sentences in the Crown Court. We've heard that from the barristers, a big backlog caused by COVID. Then you have people, young people, who many commit these knife crimes, released on bail, stabbing again. They're not thinking about um, sentencing when they're getting angry and fired up. Whether you need more stop and search, that's one idea. But knife crime has been a problem going back to Gordon Brown time in office. Knife archers going to railway stations, knife archers going to schools, which should detect if you're carrying a, a blade or a weapon. I mean, you know, the, the, the guest there, Mark, there is right to say, why can you buy large Rambo knives on, on, on the inter internet? What are they possibly for? They're not for chopping vegetables. They are dangerous weapons. You know, you shouldn't be able to, be able to buy them. I think there's, also, there's a, it's a whole, it's a kind of holistic approach here, not just one thing, sentencing, stop and search, education. It, it, all those things must come together as one, but it's a nightmare. It's been going on for, and, and the, the depression Mark's voice there. Uh, yet again, he's on TV talking about the same issue, unresolved. I mean, it's another in, in the intro for the next Prime Minister. Yeah, indeed. Thanks, Chris. Let me know your views. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Well, so Boris has been on the beach bronzing while the country collapses into crisis under a zombie government. And somehow, there's still two more weeks to go before the new occupant of Number 10 comes to crash the economy once and for all. And before Tony Blair comes scuttling out of the shadow, shouting things can only get better, well, they're probably about to get a whole lot worse. Oh, well, let's make like Marin and have some fun before it all goes to pot. It's time for this. Well, get your car nicked or your house burgled and they're probably not even going to turn up. But throw on some 90s bangers and they'll be there in high-vis tabards doing a dance routine. Police in Lincoln have been caught on camera doing the Macarena at a Pride Festival. Of course they have, but that's OK, because it apparently helps with community relations, according to their boss. All that alleged targeting under stop and search, well, they can dance in formation. Never mind that a dispersal order reportedly had to just be issued a couple of hours after this when a large number of fights broke out in the city. And what about unbridled misogyny in their ranks? Nothing to see here. These boys can bust moves to a song about a hussy that should have been condemned to the dustbin of history. And those soaring crime rates. What's the problem? I mean, look at the hip action on those coppers. Now, why is it that all we got was some supermarket sarnies and a bottle of warm Prosecco when every other country seems to have a proper partying Prime Minister? Berlusconi did the whole bunga bunga thing and now Finland's arguably totes gorge young PM has got the rap for going out and partying into the wee small hours with pop stars and telly celebs, even agreeing to do a drugs test to show she wasn't on happy pills. Well, the women of Finland aren't having any of it. They've been posting videos in solidarity of them also busting some shapes on the dance floor. But her critics say it all looks a little reckless since Finland agreed to join NATO, rattling neighbour Russia. Well, Marin also was forced to apologise for going out clubbing till 4am after coming into contact with a COVID-19 case, saying she missed the text telling her to isolate because she left her work phone at home. Just as well they don't have one of those big red briefcases with some pretty critical codes.
Now, while young people in Finland may be loving their leaders' ability to connect with fellow millennials, it's hardly likely many here are going to cast a supportive vote, having yet again been cast into oblivion by political leaders. Universities are now calling for tuition fees to go up to 24 grand a year, blaming the major intake of foreign students, especially Chinese, of course, on necessary admissions to get extra cash. So not only did young people get locked up for two years and have their brains addled by social media telling them to change gender or self-harm, <laughs> they will also never buy a house and will be paying off our spiralling national debt as well as their own if they deign to get themselves an education. The country hates the youth. Let's give the last <laughs> word to you. <laughs> Uh, in, in order, I mean, 24,000 a year is outrageous. I think um, as a father of children at university, it's shocking the way they've been I told... I heard you actually whisper an expletive when I said <laughs> that number. 24 grand! I mean, 9,000 a year at the moment. Of course, that's paid back if you earn over 24 grand in your, in your, uh, in your, um, when you get in, into the workforce. But I think they've had a really hard time as students. And that is, I mean, it's, they are tone deaf, I think, universities. There is no actual right to complain if you get a bad service as a student. How do you get money back? You're paying for a service, you're getting given 10 weeks of uh, lectures on YouTube and told to email in your questions to your tutor. It's outraged. I think students are, are treated appallingly and any party that got on the side of students would do well at the next elections. Quickly on to Marin. Poor Marin, but she is Prime Minister. You can't go clubbing and looking a bit like, like she was, dancing like that. And if that was a male or female Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. It's pretty poor. Uh, and the plea to the Macarena, I think the problem is the issue there is context. At the time, it was fine, you're surrounded by people at a, at a, at a march, but of course, there's wider issues at stake and you can't be seen to be doing that if you're the police. But I, I know why it happened. It happens every year at Notting Hill Carnival. It does, it does. That's coming up soon as well, isn't it? It's so a we bit can of fun, look Alex. forward. We can look forward to some twerking cops in the very <laughs> near future. Christopher, thank you so much for your company today. Thanks. Always love it. Anyway, lots of you have been getting in touch during the show on energy bills. Ashley says, if the prices are going to soar as predicted, whilst at the same time the national grid is predicting power cuts then why are we all going to be charged extortionate amounts to potentially sit in the dark? On strikes, Graham says, it's totally unacceptable when the country is recovering from COVID for anyone to go on strike. Shame on those who do. It is not the majority of the people to blame. It is the unions. Jamie says, workers in all industries will choose industrial action through trade unions unless those at the stock top start being serious about pay and conditions and less obsessed with their huge wages, bonuses and profits. I kind of agree with that one. On sewage in the sea, Michael says, it seems the water companies have failed miserably in protecting our planet from pollution. Well, there you go. The country is falling apart. You can join me to hear more of that tomorrow on We Need to Talk About. Same time, same place, two o'clock if you've got the stomach for it. Coming up next, of course, it's the briefing with Darren McCaffrey, I'm sure, with tales of joy. But first of all, let's have a little look at the weather forecast. Have a lovely afternoon and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Hello, Alex Deacon here with your latest weather update from the Met Office. It's a bit of a messy situation with the weather at the moment. It's quite a lot of cloud around. Some rain and drizzle in places, but it's quite warm and humid, and that's because these weather fronts are drifting in from the Atlantic. Low pressure is nearby and bringing with them a lot of warmth, a lot of humidity and uh, quite a lot of cloud. Having said that, we started the day with a fair bit of sunshine over the east. Uh, many eastern parts of England will stay generally dry and bright, just the cloud increasing. Further west, we've got some heavier rain through Wales, and we could see some heavy showers developing over the Midlands, parts of northwest England through the afternoon. Not a great great deal of rain across the southeast. Some patchy rain getting into southern Scotland, much of northern Scotland staying dry. It is quite warm, temperature in the teens across northern Scotland, but elsewhere getting into the low to mid 20s. We'll see a bit more of that showery rain working across into northeast England, Lincolnshire and eastern parts of Scotland through the evening. For the west, it does become a little bit drier with clearer spells, uh, but it will still be quite a warm night. It's only a warmer night than last night across much of Scotland with temperatures holding up in towns and cities in the mid-teens. So again, that warm, that humid feel as we head into tomorrow. 
Again, a bit of a messy picture with a fair bit of cloud around, but some sunny spells over the Midlands, eastern England, northeast Scotland, but quite a bit more cloud further west. Northern Ireland may brighten up at times, but uh, Wales and southwest England looking likely to see some further heavy showers developing by the afternoon. They'll be hit and miss, however, and in the brighter spells, again, feeling quite warm temperatures in the southeast with a bit of sunshine, could get into the uh, high 20s for a time. The likelihood of a few more of those heavy showers across parts of the Midlands, South Wales, spreading into northern England during Tuesday evening and further wet weather could come into the southwest as we head into Wednesday. It is all very messy through the rest of this week with some showers around, but still some warm sunshine across the southeast, looking a little drier as we head towards the weekend. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.